Okay, we're back for lesson number two. Uh, we're talking about prayer. And uh, lesson number two is dealing with how to pray. Remember I said this was a simple, basic course. This course is designed to challenge you and teach you to become the person of prayer that God has called you to be. Amen? Amen. So deep in the heart of every believer is the conviction that prayer is important. It's there whether you, whether you think about it consciously or not. It's there. And as you grow and develop in the Lord, you'll find that you pray continually. Your mind is always on the Lord. Your prayers, your thoughts are always about prayer, praying, communicating, relating to God, offering up to God, listening to God, agreeing with God, obeying God. Amen. Amen. So uh, there's no activity that's more important to the development of the human spirit and the character of Jesus Christ than that of prayer. You say, I'm having trouble. I'm struggling with certain issues and with, in the area of character. Some of it's generational curse. Some of it's just the old flesh wanting to rule. Some of it is um, just poor habits or it can be bad company that has corrupted our character. You know, we become like what we spend time with. Spend time with Jesus, you act like Jesus. Spend time with the devil, well, you know the rest. So in spite of general knowledge, most believers live in a chronic state of apology and regret that they pray so little. See how the devil does with that. He, he, he knows you should be praying. And he knows you know you should. And so the devil uses that as another major form of condemnation. It's not to put you in some religious box that says you have to pray an hour. When I went to Bible college uh, in the early years, of course, uh, uh, things probably have changed since then. But uh, we were taught that for every hour you preach, you must pray an hour. And, you know, uh, well, I practiced that faithfully. But I, I began to realize that there is no specific requirement because when you put prayer in some type of box or formulation, you minimize the effectiveness of prayer because then it doesn't come from the heart, it comes from the head to design to meet that formula. So I begin to realize that uh, number one, sometimes an hour's worth of prayer is not reasonable. You don't have an hour. Uh, and it may not even be necessary because after all, so the most effective prayer, when it's really sincere from the heart, can just be one word, help. <laughs> help, Lord. Uh, so, but at the same time, I realized that there are times one hour is not enough. It's not based on the time of a clock. It's based on our ability to find ourselves shift and position into a place where the prayer we're praying can be answered. You see, prayer is not about changing God. It's not about making God do something or moving God. It's about positioning us to receive. Think about that. So there are many reasons why people don't pray as they know they should. And there are a lot, uh, there may be a lot of reasons why people neglect prayer based on spiritual uh, issues in their lives. And some of these might include lukewarmness in their relationship with the Lord. A word we might use today, the apathy. Eh, just not interested in it, you know. Uh, I don't have. I don't want to have to spend the time. Uh, it might be a lack of forgiveness toward others. We sort of like know in the back of our mind that if I start spending time with God, God's going to put His finger on that issue, and He's going to make me do something about it. Yeah, if that's what you're thinking, you need to pray. Amen. Uh, a disobedient lifestyle that hides from God. We know we just aren't making the choices God has clearly said we're to make concerning life. Uh, we know that God's been dealing with us about decisions that we're moving forward in, or we've made, but we don't want to deal with the issue. We don't want to be confronted with truth, so we hide from God, hoping to get away from the conviction or the dealings of the Lord. And what we don't realize is, is we just position ourselves for further dealings. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, I advise you to read that. It'll make you want to pray. Um, uh, those whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Prayer is a really good way, when you're sincere in your prayer, to avoid some chastening. Amen. Uh, overconfidence in self. We don't want to take the other route. Well, you know, I'm just such a good person. I'm so confident that what I'm doing is right. No, no, no. Always submit everything to the Lord in prayer. Amen. And let him be the judge. Amen. 
Yeah, so the way that we deal with these spiritual problems is through repentance and change. They're primarily two structural problems that we all face when seeking to bring order to our prayer life. Number one, we struggle with issues related to the pitch and tempo of modern life. Modern life just has a beat to it. And that beat is demanding. It says you will serve this lifestyle that the world has created and designed. And you're going to serve it. You're going to march to the beat of the drum. Okay? Those who lived in previous centuries operated by the calendar and the sun, the di sundial. We live in a time when things are measured in nanoseconds. And it creates two problems. We have difficulty in finding a daily period of time that is immune to interruptions. And then we have difficulty quieting our minds that are so full of all the pressures and demands that are placed upon us and the hurried pace with which we live our lives, okay? So um, you say, yeah, that's right, you know, Dr. Lee, we, we can't help it. It ain't our fault. Uh, but ultimately, where the rubber meets the road, you are the one person who's responsible for your schedule. You can't pass it off on nobody else. You can't blame anybody else. You're the person who says yes and no to the things you agree to do. You determine what you're going to do. If prayer becomes first in your life and number one priority, if prayer itself becomes your greatest need that you pray about, then you'll make that decision. And then you'll begin to see God help you, and you'll be able to fulfill it. And from that point on, you'll begin to see great things. I, I want you not to feel like prayer is always going to be this difficult, hard thing that God's making me do. No, prayer can become a fulfilling, enjoyable, powerful relationship with God. Jesus loves to talk to his daddy. And he's your father too, amen. So we struggle with the issue that the disciples struggle with. And that was how to pray. Uh, Jesus said to them, he said, Could you not watch with me for one hour? The truth is that many believers have difficulty in fulfilling 15 minutes with prayer. How do you pray? How does that work for you? There are ways to deal with the pitch and the tempo of life. Before we can deal with any of these things, though, we need to stop and ask ourselves some questions. What are the most important things in life? What really comes first in my life? Am I more interested in religious service or getting to know God in a personal way? What counts the most to me? What I do or who I am? What means more to Christ, my work for Him and my relationship to Him? And what is most important, ability and activity or coming to the image of Christ? And only you can answer these questions and only you can do something about them and maybe break up some fallow ground. If your answer is the same as mine, you'll soon realize that all the things that are most important in our relationship to God are cultivated through and dependent upon prayer. The only conclusion that you can come to is that regular prayer is perhaps the most important thing that you can do. Jesus was the busiest man on the face of the earth, and yet, even at his busiest times, he knew that he had to withdraw himself for prayer. There's three things that are necessary in dealing with the pitch and the tempo of life. Number one, you need a quiet place. For Jesus, it was the wilderness, or perhaps a mountain, or a solitary place. He said in Luke 6, 12 through 13, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. I'm feeling here that Jesus wasn't just going on his own ability to make choices or his own criteria that perhaps through his uh, time in ministry that he had uh, developed and what he liked in his fellow leadership team. No, he said, God, I'm coming to submit this to you and uh, and then also receive any additional insight or if you want to uh, eliminate some of my thoughts, God, then I submit this to you. This is how prayer works as you go before the Lord. So a quiet place, amen. Uh, the, number two, for the men of old, it was a personal altar. 
the word altar simply means a place of slaughter or sacrifice. For holy men and women of old, it was that personal place of sacrifice that became their own personal sanctuary or holy place. And let's just look at some examples quickly through the list, and you can look up the scriptures later. And I encourage you to do that. That's part of what these courses are about. There's no way in the few few uh, uh, minutes or hours that we spend in lecture that we can cover effectively these outlines. That's why I try to stay so close to the outline, because if I don't, I could go off and chase one point for an hour and really expound and really you know really add to it but i feel that what we have written down we have it there because it's what is the foundation or it is this the skeleton of what needs to be communicated we trust that the holy spirit will fill in the lines for you and relate it to you and your ministry personally and so that's why we kind of relate this we also expect you to read the scripture we expect you to spend time studying and researching the topic and the subject that your course is about yeah i know that we've had students probably more than I'd like to even think about, who have just uh, pretended like they watched the video lectures, gone straight to the test, and I now know that's happened, believe it or not, I'll let you in on a secret, we know exactly what you do because the software on the back side tells us how much time you spend on a video, how much time you spend doing this and that, and so, you know, uh, we're not as gullible as we'd look, uh, but we are saddened when students don't take advantage of the teaching and the training, the outlines and the material and fully uh, capitalize on what is really there. You can do a whole course in a short amount of time and just get credit for it. But you're wasting your money because you have, you're not gonna grow. You're not gonna receive and carry with you through life what is contained in these lessons if you will study them. Keyword, study them, amen. Not just go over them. Uh, so let's talk about these guys. Noah had his own altar. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Samuel, David, Solomon, Elijah, they all had their own altars. And we need to have something that is like an altar. I don't mean you need to go and build a, uh, you know, a, a rock formation or, or uh, something of that nature or, or even uh, have a carpenter build you a modern day altar that's like a bench. No, I just simply mean a place of being with God. Amen. Uh, Matthew 6, 6, uh, Jesus says, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father, who is in a secret place. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. It doesn't matter where this place is, and it doesn't have to be a closet. It can be an office. It can be an attic. You can go out in the backyard and talk to God. Amen. Uh, the thing is, is communicating with God and not being distracted and being with him. So, so, so quiet time is so important. The most common time in the Bible for prayer is the first part of the day. Somebody said uh, you want a hymn in both days, I mean both ends of the day with prayer and that way it won't be so likely to unravel. I thought that was kind of, uh, kind of, kind of nice. Uh, and it's a good concept. Mark 1.35 says Jesus prayed early in the morning. It actually says it this way. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and he departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. Uh, the psalmist encouraged an early morning prayer encounter with God. He says, give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. And in the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. Amen. Psalms 88, 13. Uh, but to you I have cried out, O Lord. And in the morning my prayer comes before you. Amen. So these are good uh, examples. Uh, 119, 147 says, I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. Uh, good examples of why for many of us it may be good to start off with prayer in the morning. It becomes our number one priority. I understand some people are not morning people. I'm not a morning person. Um, uh, if uh, you know, so you find that time that's best for you it can be in the middle of the afternoon, but you want it to be a consistent, uh, kind of like an appointment with God. Amen. The important thing is to develop that routine in prayer. Uh, need a quiet mind. Psalms 131 says, "Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me." Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. 
like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord for this time forth and forever. Wow. You see, one thing I love about uh, the man of God here, uh, he understood that he had control over his soul. His soul didn't have control over him. Thinking of another time, David said, Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. When, when you just casually read over that, you may not get it. What happened was, is he's saying, Soul, I command you, bless the Lord. All that's within me, I command you, bless the Lord. He understands sometimes his soul don't want to bless the Lord. His body and all that's within him don't feel like blessing the Lord. So what does he do? He takes authority over his soul. What is the soul? Mind, will, and emotions. That means feelings, decision-making power. And will implies what he's going to do. So I say to all those things within me, ha, ha, you don't control me. I control you. And so therefore you will line up with what I tell you to do. And it's in agreement with the word. Amen. So yeah, speak to your soul. Amen. Uh, speak to your soul. Glory to God. So there are four things that can help us learn how to pray. Uh, the four things are understanding what prayer is not, understanding what it is, understanding the key components of prayer, and understanding the various models of prayer. So let's talk about understanding what prayer is not. Prayer is not a magic formula. Um, scripture says in Acts 19, 13 through 16, and then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord, Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, We exercise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Uh, also, there are seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered, and he said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, that overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. I'm telling you, just because you pray doesn't mean it's doing any good okay uh, there's got to be intimacy there's got to be relationship because prayer works uh, and it's based on relationship it's not a certain way of saying the prayer or the words you don't have to say uh, I grew up a little child in the Southern Baptist Church got saved in the Southern Baptist Church love the Southern Baptist Church uh, the Southern Baptist Church at that time we're talking in the early 60s okay uh, when someone prayed, they said, Thou art a mighty God, and we love thee, O God. Uh, we prayed like we were uh, Elizabethan Christians or something. It's funny how people think that, that that's the way Jesus spoke, you know, but of course, you know, well, it wasn't. Um, and so we should pray like that. Uh, by the way, Jesus didn't read the King James Bible either, okay? Uh, so prayer works because it's a relationship. It's not vain or empty sayings or anything of that nature. Uh, scripture says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for many words. Right. So even what is commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer can be said in this fashion. Uh, there are people every Sunday in certain places who perhaps who recite the Lord's Prayer as a part of their morning worship service. They haven't even thought about what it means uh, in years. Uh, it's just something we do, so here it comes, you know, and we're not even contemplating the meaning of it. And so there's no relationship there. There's no intimacy expressed in it. And so it just becomes dead works. Prayer is not that way. Martin Luther once challenged a man that he could not say the Lord's Prayer and concentrate on what he was saying uh, for the whole prayer. And he said, if you can do this, I will give you this horse. And the man accepted the challenge. And as soon as he said the amen to his prayer, he said to Luther, does the bridle come with it? Obviously, he was thinking about the horse and not the prayer. And sometimes that's what we're doing. We're not thinking about what 
is being sent or who we're communicating with or the love between us, the relationship as we pray and spend time with the Father. All we're thinking about is, am I going to get it? Prayer is not wearing God down with long speaking. Matthew 6 and also uh, 23. Uh, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Prayer is not about a performance. Uh, and it's not about trying to, uh, you know, manipulate or convince God to get on your side. Amen. It's not a superficial routine. It involves sincere asking, continued seeking, and persistent knocking. We've read this text already, so I won't read it again. But uh, it is profound. Prayer is not a religious form or show. Luke 18, 9 through 14 says, And also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as the tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a tax collector, or a sinner, actually is what it says. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So prayer is not dictating to or making demands of God, but submitting ourselves to His purpose and His will. That's the whole life of Christianity. Christianity is not a life that you enter into for what you're going to get, although what you get is the best that can be given or received. The motivation behind Christianity is number one, regret and repentance. It's genuine sorrow for sin and the broken relationship with a God who loves us and who died for us. Secondly, it's about doing His will, not our will or getting our desires. It's about giving up your life for Him. That means all the luxuries and pleasures. That means anything that does not fall under the uh, alignment of what he has called you to do. And yes, some people say God's a fair God, but that's only if you have the mind of Christ and see it from God's perspective. Because yes, he is a fair God. The problem is, is that we don't understand fairness. We think if somebody else gets favor uh, in a situation, I should get favor in a situation. We think if someone else is blessed, uh, let's say secretly or or in some way with a hundred dollars and then God should surely be fair and give me a hundred dollars Because I'm his child too, but in actuality God meets our needs and he blesses us in accordance with his will I want you to pray about that. Okay That you understand that and that uh, in spite of things you may have been taught or you might have encountered experience God has a specific will for your life. You want to pray for that will to be done, which means that you're going to need great grace to put down your own carnal fleshly desires. The mind has its own agenda. The soul has its own goals and purposes. And they often do not align with the will of God until you bring your soul in to subjection to the will of God and you have a renewed mind and you only get that through prayer and reading the word amen uh, and submitting yourself to God listen don't think that you're not going you'd rather be doing something else and you can even find a thousand good reasons you can even find scriptures sometimes if you take them out of context to back up what you want yet in your heart you know it's contrary to what God's called you to do that don't fly with God. You're responsible for hearing from God and for responding by making decisions that come in alignment with His purpose for your life. Yes, God calls some people to spend their lives in the gutters living with poor, uh, sickly people and caring for them and preaching to them and ministering to them. Yes, God calls missionaries to go to the slums of Calcutta, to go to the backside wilderness in Africa, to go to South America, to preach 
to natives in the uh, the Amazon jungle that have never heard the gospel. There won't be any television shows or movie theaters. There won't be any bluebell ice cream. I'm sorry you can pray all day, but it won't fall from heaven. You're going to make your own ice cream if you get to eat it. Amen. But what you will pray for is the ability to reach the lost. The ability to move in the power of God and establish His kingdom. And yes, God will probably have somebody drop a gallon of bluebell ice cream with a parachute and it'll get to you just in time one day to bless you. But I wouldn't count on it. Though God does stuff like that occasionally to show you that He does love you and He does care about your natural desires. But... They cannot be used as a substitute or an excuse to keep you from obeying Him if He's called you to a life of greater sacrifice than your brother or your sister. Don't say God's not fair. How come God called them to reach the rich in Hollywood and they minister on the streets of Hollywood and they live in a penthouse and they drive a fancy car and all these things and He called me to the ghetto because He loves the lost and because He's already reached you and that very very essence of that should cause you to willingly say God not my will but thy will be done you read in the scripture in John chapter 12 Jesus was not excited about going to the cross and dying he said Father <laughs> let me put it in our language if there's any way God he was praying by the way if there's any way God you can get me out of this mess I'm, I'm changing the language. I'm changing you, the structure there so you can see what he really was saying. He says, not my will, but thy will be done. Uh, but you read up there uh, around verse 23 or 4, Jesus, Jesus, the scripture says, was troubled in his soul. You know what that word is? That you know, In the Greek, it's anxiety. Jesus almost had a panic attack. But immediately in that same verse, it says, come, not my will, but thy will. And what he says is, is, Father, glorify thyself. In other words, God, I'm about to have a panic attack over this situation. But I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to think about your will being done. So go ahead, God. Glorify yourself. That's prayer. That's ministry. That's power. Power to overcome. Overcome what, Pastor Lee? overcome your flesh that opposes you doing the will of God that opposes you fulfilling God's purpose on your life oh there's all kinds of temptations the flesh wants to wants your ministry to, to, to get to places before you're ready to get there the flesh wants you to have things you're not capable of handling and stewarding uh, to the, the, our flesh wants us to get there too early and our natural mind until we bring it and subject it to the things of God through prayer our natural mind is not able to really really discern and put those things in place that's why we need to pray yeah Hebrews 5, 7 says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save Him from death. And He was heard because of His relevant, His reverent submission. Man. Think about that for a minute. Passionately, vehemently, He's crying out to God, Save me from death. The scripture says he was heard because of his reverent submission. He was heard. Yet we know he died. God heard his prayer. His prayer was, save me from death. But he died. God answered his prayer. He died to the flesh so he could accomplish the will of the Father. Understanding what prayer actually is. Prayer is talking with God. Uh, <clears throat> as such, prayer is communicating with God in much the same way that you would communicate to a person. Can you imagine using prayer formulas when talking to a friend or a relative? When you communicate a fellowship with another person, there are certain areas that are commonly covered. Uh, you usually tell them what you appreciate about them, 
You acknowledge their contribution to your life. You make them aware of your personal needs and the needs of those uh, close to you. You make sure that you settle any offenses that may affect your relationship with them. You share your personal plans and goals with them and seek their input. You listen to what they may want to say to you. And so prayer is listening to God. Um, Isaiah 55, 3 says, Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live. Hmm. When you communicate with others, it is meant to be a two-way experience. When you communicate with others, you do not simply talk to them. You let them talk to you as well. When you spend time with the Lord, some of that time should be spent listening to His communication to you and simply waiting on Him, basking in His presence. Amen? So let's understand the key components of prayer. And this will be based on the above understanding of communication. It's easy to see the most common components of prayer. And there are basically five principal components of prayer. And you may want to memorize these, perhaps. Or at the very least, uh, keep this outline because you're going to want to teach this. You're going to want to not only practice it, you're going to want to communicate it to others. Number one, praising God for who He is. And this is where we rehearse back to God His awesome character attributes, His glory. This, verse 1 through 3, says, I will extol you, mighty God, my God. O King, I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I'll bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. In other words, you just go on about God. You just brag on God. You just declare his majesty, amen. Oh my. And you're going to find yourself engulfed in his presence. Because the scripture teaches that God inhabits the praises of his people. I'm going to tell you something. You start praising God, He'll come to you. Thanking God for what He's done is number two. This is where we acknowledge the fact that everything that we have comes from God. And show appreciation even for the seemingly small things. And I want to just insert something here, interject something here before we move on. Um, thanking God for what He's done is not complete if we're not satisfied with what God has done. Thanking God for what He's done is not adequate if we also are complaining for what He hasn't done. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. How many times in 41 years of ministry has someone come to me and said pastor I just want to know what the will of the Lord is for my life well we just read it it starts right here 1st Thessalonians 5 16 through 18 rejoice always pray without ceasing in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning put your name right there you. Amen. Here's another one. Psalms 100, verses 4 through 5. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Amen. Praise God. Uh, asking God for things that we need. And this is uh, this is when we petition God to come to our aid and give us those things that are consistent I said consistent with his promises and his will for our lives. He says, uh, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That in itself is a, uh, a guide of how to pray, how to communicate with God right there. Uh, confessing sins to God, number four, and asking for mercy. This is where we acknowledge our shortcomings, where we acknowledge our failures, we miss the mark, uh, where we sin, amen. Uh, talking about iniquity, transgressions, we're talking about uh, sin. Uh, sin, according to James, the half-brother of Jesus, chapter four, means uh, 
uh, if a man knows to do good, he does it not to him it is sin. There's a definition from the Bible for sin. Um, it also involves reinforcing our desire to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. So uh, we, we read it this way. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a fl flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. Amen. That's Psalms 32, 5 through 6. So, fifthly here, it's sharing our heart with God concerning his destiny and our innermost desires. And this is where we share our dreams and visions, our desires and our longings, our goals and plans, and we lay them before the Lord. I said, lay them before the Lord. In other words, we open up with God. We tell Him what we are being attracted to, what we are feeling led to do, and uh, we lay them before the Lord. Amen. I said, lay them before the Lord. Amen. Not force them on the Lord. Amen. Amen. Psalms 27 4 says, One thing about the desire of the Lord that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. Amen. Amen. All right.